Hello, 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 and welcome to i &E Live. I am your host, Jack Reedy, and today I'll be joined by Jason Alvarado as we discuss Verizon's Data Breach Investigations Report for 2022. If this is your first time watching, welcome. We're live streaming across all social media platforms right now, including LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. Before we get started, though, I just wanted to remind everyone that we want to hear from you. If you want to get involved, we have two options for you. For the first, be sure to like, follow, subscribe with notifications turned on for whichever platform you're using, so that way you can see the next time that we go live. For the second, feel free to drop any questions that you might have in chat with a queue in front, and the mods will grab them and send them my way, and we can address them live on show. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and ask that we bring Jason Alvarado on. He was our defensive operations instructor to talk about some uh, key points with me in the report. How are you doing, Jason? Doing great, Jack. Thanks for having me here. Um, you yeah. know, just for a little introduction, um, I've been around the information technology environment for about 25 years, a little bit of that in law enforcement. Um, and I've focused about the last 12, 13 years in cybersecurity, especially the digital forensics and incident response perspectives. Excellent. Excellent. So um, let's talk about First off, what is the Verizon Data Breach and Investigation Report and a little bit about why it matters? For those of you guys that are uninitiated or haven't been around for a little bit, um, it is basically the pulse, if you will, on what is happening in the industry or the organization. And what I mean by that is, what was it, over 23,000 individual breaches they studied this year, Jason? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so they quantifiably review a massive amount of both what we would call a compromise versus a breach, which the difference between that is whether or not your lawyers are getting involved. Let's be honest. <laughs> um, yeah, but legitimately they, they study all these individual areas where a company has been, you know, compromised professionally, and then they've bro broken it out and organized it in such a way that we can start seeing what is or is not popularized. Right. And, you know, they've been doing this for 15 years, so it, it really gives us a really good perspective and and they like to show us how how the trends of cybercrime have changed over time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I think the real the two benefits I love about this is that one, it's global. Right. Um, we see a massive, massive amount of data points across literally the world. I think the other great thing too is that it's very, very organized. Like they've got it broken down really well by specific category, attack patterns, and even still, it's 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 a high level overview. Still, like they aren't getting too deep into the weeds as to like this vulnerability was used over this vulnerability being used, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and actually, in every one of their sections, they really uh, they talk about how they're scratching the surface, really, mm -hmm. um, because you. They, they, they can inform us, but but there's just so much information out there. You can't drop into the weeds, even on a 200-page report. Yeah. I mean, the report is very large for those of you guys. Um, so we've shared the uh, links in the chat a couple times over, it looks like, uh, across all the socials. But if you, you know, we aren't going to go by it line by line, page by page, because as, as Jason said, it is a nearly 200-page report with plenty of examples, plenty of deep dives. And still, like I said, it is an overview with deep dives, which is weird to say, but you know, they manage it really well. So, um, talking about that, some of the things that, you know, we were looking at there, Jason, were, well, why don't you, why don't we just go ahead and start with what specifically is an incident in this, as far as this in reports is uh, concerned? Yeah. So I think that's really something to be, uh, to be thoughtful of because I think we all have different definitions of, of what an incident is and, and even, even, you know, the standards and training stuff, it, it differs widely. Um, so the purpose of this report is, is that we, a security incident is actually going to be an event that will compromise the integrity, confidentiality or availability of an information asset. So it's not as exactly like a, an in-map scan or a SOC alert They're They're saying an incident is actually, um, maybe when a threat actor has actually gotten into a network somehow. Yeah, yeah. And then also in here, I believe data breach, which would be yeah. if information is actually disclosed, correct? 
Correct. Correct. Yeah. So, so they're looking at it from, um, yeah, maybe a threat actor got in, but we did our IR and our forensics and the attack was more or less benign. And we can prove that, that no data was exfiltrated. So we have no breach. Yeah. Again, that's when the lawyers step in, right? Because the lawyers only really are really concerned when, when data is stolen or lost. <laughs> so. Yeah. And that's another thing also to kind of reinforce here, since we do also you know, with the education is it starts with an event, an event then gets escalated to an incident, an incident then gets escalated to a breach. And you don't use the term breach. You can use the term compromise all you want while you're doing the investigation, but you don't use the term breach until you get the lawyers involved. Because mm -hmm. the second that you start using the word breach, you start a clock and there are reporting procedures that have to go by a certain time. Mm -hmm. and, and once you start the word breach, you almost have to prove that there was no breach. So you have exactly. to do, start doing a lot of forensics and you have to, you have to convince the lawyers that you've, you've done your due diligence and, and, and you've proven how that threat actor moved through the network and, and said, well, look, but, but they didn't access any PII or they didn't access any intellectual property. They, they, yep. they want to see it just saying that, oh, nothing was reported stolen. That doesn't work. Yep. Yeah. And that's where you playing around with the word breach is very, very delicate. That's why a lot of times you'll hear people working in the know using the word compromise. That's the one we used is that like the, the assets been compromised, which is a lot easier to say, you know, it's, if it's, if the CIA in any way, shape or form can no longer be trusted, you reset back to null and then you continue on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so moving back to the DBIR, now that we have enough of a background, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's you and me, we could talk about this all day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but some of the some of the things and, you know, I think you have some slides for us, too, don't you? Yeah, I do. I got a first slide up here that uh, that kind of talks about what the DBIR has identified as our our motivations for mm -hmm. our and I'm going to stop using the word threat actor. And I'm actually going to start using things like uh, cyber criminal. Or, or criminal, yeah. um, because that, yeah. that is appropriate. Um, financial or personal gain. This has not changed mm -hmm. in their report since 2012. Um, and I think with me and Jack's experience, we'd probably say that this just hasn't changed in, let's say it's 2022, so since the 90s. <laughs> yeah. As long as I've been doing it. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, well, I, and let's be honest, you know, I mean, all of us have to make a living and some people do it in different ways. And this is the way that they choose to and what drives, you know, that economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not really that big of a surprise that all of a sudden or that nothing's really changed where it's fiscally motivated. Right. Mm -hmm. The big shift we don't have a slide for that I saw as far as the criminal aspect of this is that, you know, you know, we kind of hit a high point in credit card theft and breaches, you know, around 2008. And then all the PCI security controls went into play around then. And so, so what DBIR has shown is a trend in a massive reduction in the misuse of credit cards that they just don't work anymore. If they do, it's for a very limited time. So what we're going to move into is the, the rise of credential theft. Yes, yeah. very much so. In fact, I believe that was a very large part of this report is, um, you know, the, the use of credentials or stealing credentials from individuals, which goes to show that, you know, it's kind of amazing. Some of some of what we're doing is working, right? The systems are becoming more and more secure. So now it's about impersonating somebody that has the right access as opposed to just being able to bypass everything. Yeah, I think it's working. I think it's, I think, uh, a lot of the things that we're doing are slowly, slowly catching on. Um, and then I've got a, a next slide up here about actually kind of kind of dives into that a little bit. And it and it's uh, it's it's the incidents on the left and, and then actual what we would call a breach on the right. But if you see use of stolen credentials massively outpaces a lot of the things that we focus in on as um, as cyber defense experts, right? When I'm talking about patching our systems and mm -hmm. and watching out for network attacks, um, and then a lot of our training and education sometimes focuses heavily on network penetration testing. You know, what, it does. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that, Jack? Well, I mean, it does. But the other thing too is that I believe it was something in the neighborhood of, and I don't have the number right in front of me. I believe it was eighty over eighty percent of these breaches. Uh, had very clear user interaction in some way, shape, or form. Yep. 
which yep. means that you know they're still being able to trick the end user. And if they're if the attackers are aiming specifically for credentials, it means that they are also you know um, targeting people that know better, right? Absolutely, and uh, and you know just uh, you know phishing and botnet activity is actually down on breaches too, and it's actually down on incidents. Um, the only curious, and not not surprisingly though, on the incidents is the web application. You know, hacking really? our web applications. That again, that hasn't changed. Okay, that, okay. that's still a number one concern. Well, I mean, I, you know, you have the ubiquity of of all the different types of you know. If you have a company now, you have more websites that are coming out, things like that. Mm -hmm. I can see where that's still in there. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I'm wondering, do you know if they are including API security in that as far as web based? Um, access or attacks. Has that been a category that they've added? I did not see that category in there, Jack. I may have missed okay. it, but I did not see it. I, what I do know outside of the report is, is that API security, I mean, we're, we're having what conferences almost every other month in 2021 and 2022 yeah. about API security. It is like the next new thing. And, and I mm -hmm. think it's, it's huge with the amount of data that is either intentionally or unintentionally exposed out there. <laughs> Yeah, it's that and also, you know, people being able to write an API that connects into your own application, things like that, and the automation that comes with being cloud born in the, you know, availability and things like it, I, I think it's just ripe for abuse. You know, I think people write things that in theory work really well, but they might accidentally give it too much permissions or the ability to read too many things without enough um, authentication or authorization uh, prior to actually providing that information, right? And you know, and you know, for example, one, one good example of that, and we've covered this in some of our previous boot camps and lives is like uh, mm -hmm. the AWS API stuff, you know, how, how much data can actually be unintentionally exposed when you're just trying to do some automation within your AWS environments. Yep, or accidentally misconfiguring a GitHub page that it, that it, you know has a keys on it, or we can keep going on and on and on. Yeah, yeah, exactly, um, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. With that too, um, so did Denial, am I reading this right? Did Denial of Service pick up this year? Denial of Service has been trending for about the last three or four years, and I was, flabbergasted by that too, Jack. I just, I don't think that, that we think a lot about denial of service attacks. I, I really uh, don't think so at all. I mean, you, yeah. we, we have, we have so many third, third party providers that their entire job is just to make sure that it's accessible, you know, and then you have really basic protections like regionality, uh, you know, replicas of the, uh, of the same website that are across region to region to region. You just don't think of denial of service anymore as a and yeah and what i can say is is in my dfir times i we have seen denial of service attacks and we have seen them as kind of like a uh, part of kind of a false flag operation where where they're that they're doing a huge ddos on you um and they're they're focusing your attention on that and then there may be some some network pen the penetrations going on under that, or or maybe maybe you know that they're they're flooding your sim with information, and you're not seeing the the web attack coming in. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that we're not, hand, we're not we're still not well equipped to handle multiple simultaneous incidents. That 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 can be we can get a little hyper focused <laughs> sometimes. I uh, yeah, I think so. I also um, you know when you talk about attack campaigns versus just randomized instances i think that that's also a mindset that we're still combating within a SOC environment frequently is that you know we just we find one alert we stick to that one alert we might scan the entire network for all the indicators of compromise you know and we might even do a root cause analysis on that specific alert provide fixed actions and whatever else but i think that we too often look at a box and we say okay this is how they got in this is compromise whatever else wipe it erase and move on right for speed and everything else we don't necessarily uh pay attention to everything that could be going on yeah but i do i think the um a lot of the ddos stuff started with what the deutsche telecom stuff when mm -hmm. that was about three or four years ago and i think it's just these amplification attacks they're just doing whatever they can to to slow you down i think some of that might actually be you know in the previous slide we talked about grudges and discontent and yeah. stuff like that people are unhappy with a, a service provider so they flood them 
I can see know. that. I yeah. can very much either either service provider or a specific site or anything else. I mean, what is it? Krebs on security, I'm pretty sure, has been DDoSed. I can't tell you how many times as well as Docs because he keeps talking about people that don't like him. <laughs> so much that uh, that his service provider said we successfully stopped this this time, but it took up so much of our resources that, that we actually have to start charging you for the hosting now. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that, that was a funny wow. article by him. Yeah. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, so major. So we were talking about the majority of the breaches between the web applications and our service. Um, which email we, you know, we we're talking about social engagement. That's sitting there somewhere around ten to fifteen percent. Um, it looks like we have a new attack vector though. Software updating or which is supply chain compromise. Correct. Yeah. So I think you know. With the with the solar winds um, breach, that I don't think I, that's not actually a slide. Sorry. No worries. No worries. Yeah. Well, we can kind of skip over to this one. That might show it a little bit. Um, with with the solar winds breach, I think it's kind of opened up a new Pandora's box. Um, just because you know, a a really, I guess I'll speak from the mind of a bad guy first. A really awesome new attack vector was was opened up and disclosed and now the copycats are stepping in um we're they're not talking about a big solar winds level of a uh, supply chain breaches but but uh vendors vendor chain type stuff um and they're seeing a lot of activity in a lot of the remote desktop sharing mm. at software so so code is getting slipped in that code is getting compromised every now and then and we are seeing malware being deployed via via those types of uh of software updates however the big however on that is that uh even though that's a uh, incident vector they're actually mm-hmm. seeing that it's only contributing to less than one percent of actual breaches ah, so there's okay. a plus side yeah i mean that's it's one of those that i think that when it hits it's extremely significant right so that it while it only represents one percent it still represents a big threat, a major threat, right? Yeah, I mean, supply chain breaches. I mean, that the solar winds was so big that we, you know, mm-hmm. I, w- I was doing proactive incident responses. So we're going to declare an incident, even though we don't know of of an incident or a breach. We just want to activate DFIR and see what things look like. I mean, lots yeah. of money was burned on proactive that act that turned out to be, hey, nothing, you're fine. Mm-hmm. You know, exactly. Yeah, it. I think I think that, and I also think that uh, it was just it, that that attack was so well done. It was it was so successful. It stayed so, silent for so long. So elegant that codes out there in the wild. I mean, I, I have never seen a more elegant set of codes that could do all the defensive evasion on EDR virtualization. I mean, if you, you name you name a defensive technology we use, and and it had a way to evade it. And stay stealthy mm. so that that was it's scary that that code is out there honestly yeah no last time i saw something like that was when i was in the marines and looking for apts like yep. that that was some high level stuff um so yep. it, it's kind of and the fact that you know now it's just that's the new bar the bar has been set right and the attack patterns there you know it's it's a new play in the playbook so i think Again, I, I just think it's something to be wary of, though. It's not going to keep me up at night, but no, yeah. no, me either. But I think you always have to be aware of it, and uh, and you know that's. Uh, I think it it the biggest the biggest takeaway in that section of the report was that uh, we have to start you know establishing trust and having deeper conversations with our our third party vendors and our software providers and. Uh, and, and, and that's just a continuation of, of what we've always done. It's just now we're focusing on the software they're providing us. Yeah, yeah. Well, with that, I also see that you, you listed out that there's a div, uh, diverse list of vectors, but a massive amount of coverage on them. Yeah, that was very interesting and nonspecific at the <laughs> same time. <laughs> really helpful there. <laughs> I, I know. Um, what it basically said is that there are hundreds of tools out there and TTPs mm-hmm. that that on their own cannot reach the top 10 
to make it okay. in the DBIR report. But as a whole, they're representative of about 70% of all the breaches out there. I'm sorry, incidents, oh, wow. not breaches. So, and, and we just see that. Think about all the different, I mean, penetration testing tools that are, I mean, are getting released on GitHub on an almost daily basis. You know, and I, and I think that's what they're alluding to, you know, and probably some, uh, some APT style tools also that we just tailored access type stuff that, that we just will never get a good idea on. Mm -hmm. Very much so. But that's amazing. 70, over 70% 70 are just random here, random there, little bits and bites. It was enough, and, but, and, 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 and the way they worded it was that they had to really take a really hard look at this and say, say, we just have to group all of these together because then it elevates it into the number three attack vector. That makes so, sense. Yeah. I, I can see that where it's just like this happened, but there's no way to really classify it accordingly other than other, you know, it, it, mm -hmm. I, th I think it's one of those things where yeah, there's there are options, right? There's so many different options that are available. There's so many attack vectors specifically. So I'm guessing when combined, um, while we have the other the other section, email is still an attack vector that's considered here. Like, what are some of the others? Um, you know, email and that that like you said, that includes social engineering via email and then malware okay. deployment via email. So that's going to be like uh, you know, Emotet is back. And I'm sure that's what it's talking about. And, and as we know, Emotet, you know, is the is the fileless malware, um, mm -hmm. and it is deployed based mostly through through PDF files and email and Word and stuff like that. Um, and then, of course, backdoors and C2, and that that kind of ties into email also. Uh, okay. That is the other big one. And then, yeah, web app and denial of service again. Um, but yeah, I think I think backdoors. I, what I interested, you know, we spend a lot of time focused on C2, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's a Cobalt Strike beacon or some of the other beacons that are out there. And then yeah. and then we spend a lot of hyper focus searching for those and detecting those. And I actually think we've gotten tools out there that have made it, I won't say easy, but better to detect. And maybe that's why it's only 17% now. I think that's fair. I, and I would argue that generally speaking, it is a lot easier than it used to be to detect this stuff. Um, I think that's just because of, you can even go by based on uh reputation list. You know, if it's not, if it's not in the top hundred thousand of regular traveled websites out there, um, take a look at it, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. You know, uh, and the, the, the tools that we have now that can rapidly process log files and look for, for like domain uniqueness and, and which is what a lot of C2 relied on. I, I just, it, again, I don't think it's easy, but it's so much better now. I would agree. I would, uh, I would definitely agree. A uh, quick question from Bob. Bob is API security slash hacking covered in INE training. Something we're going to be getting to a little later on this uh, year there, Bob, Bob. Um, don't have specifically API security up though. It is covered in a couple of our courses that are part of a larger thing. So. Yeah, I just want yep. to mention that. Yep. And I, I know, Bob, Bob, I did do an AWS incident response boot camp, and we did talk about AWS API security in there a little bit, but yeah. We are focused on getting a, a full-on course out later this year um, that is going to uh, cover not only just the best practices that involve the security, but also some of the coding practices that are behind it, as well as ways that you can monitor API usage across a diverse global ar architecture as well. We're putting a lot of thought into it, making sure that it's a really well done course. So, but yeah, um, you know, there's uh, something else on here on this report that I saw, Jason, which is, you know, threat actor timelines are flipping 60 to 80%, right? Yeah, and I think that's huge. Um, mm -hmm. We have taught in cybersecurity that you need to prepare and hunt for the threat actor that's been in your network, what, was it three to six months? Yeah, typically. very much. Um, the new the new studies are showing that now it's days. It's flipping. It was 60% three to six months. And then now it's 20% days. Um, I don't have that one up either. Um, but yeah, so so now now they're in there faster. And they're they're getting out mm. faster too. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the term is advanced 
advanced persistent threat. And, you know, that was, that was the idea was the just longevity of their attacks that went over, like you said, three to six months and trying to find those individuals that look like a regular everyday user, but instead they're stealing everything, you know, under the sun in the kitchen sink too. Mm -hmm. And And now we're just not seeing that. Yep. And I think some of it has to do with this slide that I have up here right now on the on the number of steps that we see to accomplish a, a successful breach. Uh, you know, it used to be, uh, according to Verizon, you know, 75 unique actions that that a cyber criminal would have to take to to accomplish a breach. But if you mm-hmm. look at this, we're down to five to 20 steps. Um, you know, I'm just going to throw an example out there, Jack, and maybe you can use some of your uh, your red team knowledge here. Y- y- you know, what does it take these days if you've got some creds to get into a network and and say d- dump a listing of domain users and get in and get out? How how, how? if you script it, not much at all. I mean, exactly. you're talking you can script out that out in almost uh, one step, if yeah. unless you need to verify something, maybe two. Right. And that's what we've seen on the IR side that these guys will come in, we'll do we'll do post forensics on on a domain controller. We'll see that mm-hmm. they. They got in through some credentials. They were able to dump a list of of, of usernames and passwords out of a domain controller, and then they're out. <laughs> there was a, there was a wonderful article series, and I can't remember who it was by, but the individual goes through and describes what it takes for him to get domain admin in an Active Directory environment and how quickly it is uh, just from a basic user account, and it's insane. And you know, you read those types of articles where when he went step by step, I think in total it was 10 steps, but that's because he was describing each step as he went. Reality wise, if he put it all into a PowerShell script, you could just kick it off and go. And he would he would basically compromise a box with the appropriate credentials and then have domain admin in one simple tool. Mm-hmm. And and we see tools out there, you know, on the internet, on GitHub, you can on the dark web, you can pay for them. I don't recommend using them because the EDRs know about them too now. <laughs> and then we'll talk about that soon. But but uh, I mean, there are pre-prepared tools, even if it's just something like what is it called, Bloodhound? You know, there, oh, there yeah, are pre-prepared Bloodhound. tools right. that can just get in, get in there, get the information you need, and get out. You know, and, and and the less noisy it is, the less it's apt to to trip a sensor in the sock or or get the hairs to raise up on an analyst. Yeah, very much so. And I mean. Uh, for those of you that are unaware about Bloodhound, uh, great, great. Def- I, I like it as a defensive tool personally, but I do know a lot of attackers that use it. You can provide credentials to it, and it will show you a pathway through the network of where those credentials can touch. If you are able to get administrative credentials, it will show you a pathway through the network as to where those administrative credentials can touch. From a defensive perspective, it's amazing because from a, a, a defensive perspective, you can take, let's say, your CISO's credentials or their administrative credentials, plug it in and say, if your account was compromised, how many independent items could also be compromised as a result, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we used to use that tool just for compromise assessments. We're using a simple tool yeah. to show you how quickly you can be breached. Exactly. <sighs> you know, um, and it kind of flows right into this slide that we got up right now. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that they... It kind of flips the script, I think, for me and Jack, because we, I know I teach the pyramid of pain, but I teach mm-hmm. it from a different perspective. <laughs> you know, I, I teach it from a perspective of, of this, is, this is about the amount of pain that I can cause a threat actor makes their job a lot more difficult. And so I actually treat things like hash values and IP addresses and domain names as a, yeah, this is the easy stuff. We're, we're annoying them, but, but we're not really being effective as threat hunters and incident responders. What Verizon, though, is saying on their research is, is that if you can get successful detections and stop your threat actors on hash values, IP addresses, and domain names, you're actually being a lot more effective than you think you are. Yep, so. absolutely. And for those of you guys that are unfamiliar with the Pyramid of Pain, um, the base... Basically, uh, easiest is going to be the bottom, or trivial as it says there, all the way up to what's considered tough. And in that, it is the most effective 
items for indicators of compromise that you can identify uh, that will let you know that somebody is in your enterprise or in your on your systems, one of the two. TTPs at the top stand for tactics, techniques, and procedures, which are basically the playbooks of the attackers that, and then just below that is the actual tool sets that they would utilize, which are generally custom binaries or things like that. All the way down at the bottom, you have hash values, IP addresses, domain names, and then slowly building up up to network host artifacts, which would be things like registry changes or um, specific signatures in the networking, the way the communication is working, especially if you know C2, the command and control structure, things like that. Having said yeah. all that, what we're seeing on that that slide, the pyramid level, the hash value appears to be caught you know, the least amount, but even still, that is uh, 13 million different times that the hash value was caught plus. IP yep. is 172,000, domain is about 700,000, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they're very common and they're being caught and they're stopping the breaches, which is really, really important. You it know? is. And, and even in incident responses, that was one of my key tools. You, even with fileless malware, if I could locate the, the fileless malware, I could, I could hash that and stick it into an EDR tool, and then I could prevent that from ever entering memory again. Yep. So, so that that is how effective even so sometimes we joke about hash values, but but they are one of our most effective tools. They are. I think I think the reason we jo joke so much about it though is how quickly and easy it is to change. You know, one of the things that, one of the things I always do whenever I'm teaching is take a text file, hello world, save it, hash it real fast in MD5, and then just add a period to it, hash it again, just to show everybody like how different that it'll, the outcome will be with just a simple period added to it and you yeah. know it polymorphic is pretty it's it's not difficult to write anymore you, there's plenty of pa service packs out there that'll let you uh create and write that stuff that'll just change you know runtime to runtime or uh compile i mean you, you, oh you know, no and yeah and if, if you missed my last uh my last boot camp for on uh on apts right we, we talked about uh conti and ah. so when you talk about hash values in, the, in an APT like Conti, they are actually checking their hash values against all of the EDRs and all of the antivirus scanners every four hours, and they're changing them. So yeah. that's how difficult hash values can be. They can, but they're still effective if you can catch them. You know, yeah. um, and, and on the flip side, so are, so are our EDR product people. They're, they're, they're checking these, their hash values every sometimes every five minutes and pushing out new updates. So that's very true too. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I, I kind of already hit on this previously, but in your mitigation section here, you talk about the human element has decreased slightly from 85 to 82%. Do you, I mean, do you really think that that shows that we're being effective or is it just that, you know, we didn't get quite as many suckers this year? No, I kind of have this, uh, I have, I have this perspective on a lot of things and information in, in IT security that we are doing. Um, it, it's kind of a security versus compliance conversation, right? Um, the human human element is is the number one part of a breach. The only way we can reduce that is by training them, training mm -hmm. our employers, training our, us our employees, and training our users, training our C level suite. Um, but are we training them to check a box for our cyber insurance policy? Or are we training them to actually, uh, what, what, what this report goes into is, are we training them to change a behavior, right? Yeah. Our, 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 our training programs are not just meant to educate, but they're meant to change behavior. So we have to, we have to go and implement a training program and then maybe even hire in I won't say higher end, we need to do research. And if we need to hire somebody to do that research for us, we need to, to look at, at, the, at essentially the efficacy of that training. Did it reduce clicks to websites? Did it, re, did it, did it indicate the change that we wanted? And, I, mm -hmm. and, and what Verizon is saying is, is overall, no, it's not really, um, at least not yet. Uh, I, I think that's fair. I think, um... Another issue you run into in corporate America is this thought process behind negative reinforcement, that if the user does click or they do fail, that we should somehow punish them. What are your thoughts? I think it's 
it's good and bad. I, I think that, 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 you know, there were some products that came out in the last few years that that was a key implementation that, that they would, they would fish against you. And if you clicked a link that it would, uh, inform your manager immediately, or it could be part of your performance review. Um, I don't know if I like my users living in fear. I'd rather have them be educated and doing the right thing because they know what the right thing is. Um, I think that it's something that should be brought up with them, you know, yeah. I, but I don't know. I, so I think there's a need to train, there's a need to educate and there's a need to report, but I don't believe in, um, snap, slapping them on the nose, if you will. You know, I, I don't believe in that form of negative reinforcement. I don't think that that helps the situation on top of it. You already talked about it or mentioned it. You kind of chase the user away from having an open dialogue with you when they do mess up. Yes. And that's what we want to prevent. We want them clicking their report phishing button mm -hmm. and knowing they're not going to get in trouble for it. We, we want them to pick up the phone and call the help desk if there's something fishy going on or, or, you know, call the, call the sender and see if they actually did say, Hey, Hey, do you really, did you really ask for my bank wire information? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, but, but I don't want to develop a culture of fear where they're afraid to do that because they're going to get criticized. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, there's that. And, and also I prefer to have the open dialogue, for example, um, once I had a user group contact me from a region, they just sent me a bunch of emails and they're like, please block these emails. I was like, that's not the way this works. We need a full investigation. Why am I just blocking random stuff that you're sending me? Right. Turns out that, um, there was a, it was one of the standardized, like, Hey, send me, I got a picture of you doing this, send me Bitcoin and I won't release it. Basic text messages that have been kind of plaguing, you know, a lot of email boxes for the last five years but specifically they targeted my organization and they just like, I got hundreds of reports that day of people hitting that fishing box. The difference was because there was not a good conversation with that particular region, they just sent me the email address, deleted the email because they were like, uh, you know, this is slander, this is everything else. And I didn't have any evidence. And without evidence, it was very hard to see what is the true sender email address, where is the, what are the headers of the information, things like that, right? Versus other offices that I had a good conversation with immediately knew how to send me the correct, you know, attach it as a, you know, an additional email, attach it, send it over to me, and I could do the analysis and put in the appropriate blocks, right? So. Mm -hmm. And the other biggest thing I can think of on this is that, that if you are doing these training programs and you want to have some type of corrective action or, or counseling, you know, make sure you have that in your, in your employee handbooks and your user agreements and, and that they understand. I mean, that's the, the, whenever I get brought into an investigation, um, my first question isn't, oh yeah, tell me what happened. It's, Hey, show me your policies. Mm. Show me what's enforceable or, and what's not enforceable, or let me show you the pitfalls. You know, you want to get mad at this user for clicking a link that deployed emote on your network, but did you have any training implemented? And then do you, did you have any policy to back that up? Cause I see that so often that no, there's not. Yeah. That are processes. Did you have any way for them to submit it in the first place? You know, what, yeah. what, what does it look like to get, a, what does the steps look like to go from, they receive it to your security desk? Yeah. But that was interesting in this report. The only real key mitigation they mentioned in the entire report is this. Yeah. Educating the human element. We know how to patch. We know how to defend against network against network attacks. <laughs> we, we know how to prevent all these things, but we don't know how to, we have not yet figured out the psychology in, in improving the human element in breaches. I, and I think, I mean, we, the trends even show that look at the credential theft right? Like the credential theft, the fact that there's, you know, 80% plus as far as user engagement for these compromises to occur, you know, at this point, they aren't able to so much abuse technology anymore. They have to abuse the credentials. And if that's the case, then that means they need to get people on board to send them to, them, right? Or engage them in somehow. Yep. Uh, and, you know, I, I just see Bob Bob put in here, constructive communication is key. And I think that's what that's what this is all about. You know, it's we have to make these these user education 
sessions and anything to, uh, and performance issues on them, we, we have to make it constructive because ultimately we value the employees. We just need to change a behavior. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, at no point does the CEO want you to go and get a bunch of Amazon gift cards. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, Jason, I think that's going to wrap it up for this. I appreciate it. I mean, this is a very large report. If you guys have not had a chance yet, again, we dropped some of the um, the URLs in the chat. You can also reach out to, uh, to either one of us via Twitter or any personal DMs or wherever um also just take a look on google it's uh verizon dbir as a reminder jason i want to thank you for your time oh thank you for having me jack i love these ah it's it's always good having you on board so i appreciate it well guys uh that's going to wrap up today's stream and thank you so much for watching if you missed it live look for the replay across all of our social channels and on the ine website We'll be alive again next Tuesday, and we look forward to hearing from you then as well. Be sure to like, follow, subscribe on your choice of social platform with your notifications on so you can stay in the loop for details on our next stream and hear about if we do any community giveaways or any new announcements. As always, bring your questions next week, and until next time, have a great time. Have a good weekend. Thank you so much. Goodbye. <laughs>